Hello and welcome to Take Time. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, and let's talk about digitized tunas. Seiko teamed up with Lowercase to produce a Fieldmaster tuna that has a digital interface. This is a first for the brand and really interesting on Seiko's part. I know a lot of purists hate the different variations of the tuna. Uh, they would prefer it just be a dive watch, not some crazy solar chronograph or um, you know, an automatic field master. And this being the evolution of that completely digital field master. And it's a really interesting interpretation. Um, I'm happy to talk on it today though, for you guys, you've likely heard a lot about this being the competitor for the Casio G-Shock. I don't really think that's true. However, we'll talk through all those points in just a moment. Now, this isn't a comparison with the Casio G-Shock, but I of course have my G-Shock off to the side to highlight some of the things I appreciate about this model as opposed to Seiko's interpretation of a digital do-it-all watch. Now, there are actually five variations of this watch already, two of them being limited edition. I won't touch on those as they're kind of hard to come by, but the three mainline ones are the SB BEP 001, 003, and 005. The 001 I have in for review today has silver button accents, while the other variations have gold trim with gold button accents, as well as black button accents with a Pepsi bezel insert. Each one of these models feature a silicone rubber strap, an unindicated type of plastic used in the body with a stainless steel case back. Um, if, in case you're wondering, these chassis are plastic. They're not DLC coated stainless steel, as well as the shroud that covers up the friction-based bidirectional bezel. So there's no click spring here. Don't expect the satisfaction of moving a clicky bezel around the dial face. Also, I'm not affiliated with this group, nor am I sponsored by them, but I do believe they bear some mentioning. I purchased this watch from Seiya Japan, and I've purchased a ton of items from them in the past. Their customer service and shipping standards are top-notch. I received this watch within two days. It was just incredible. Um, these guys are awesome. Seiya's service is awesome. Um, you always get a microfiber cloth with a purchase, and if you're a Seiko-holic like me, you get the most recent Seiko catalog. Um, there's just an unbeatable range of products on their site. And of course, if you wanted to buy a Seiko, and I've told this to other people in the past, um, Seiya. Seiya is a good way to go. If you're not trying to buy vintage or used items, you want a brand new item, they're really good. Now, please note before we go into this video, this is not a user guide on how to operate all the functions on this watch. Of course, I'm gonna highlight all the functions this digital watch features, and I'll go over how to use them, but this is not an in-depth tutorial on how to do so. This is a review for the watch. Also, the manual these come with do a pretty good job of showing you what's what. So if you're interested in getting one, I learned pretty much everything I need to know about the watch in a good 20 minutes. Now, the SBEP001 is a gargantuan watch. It's 49.5 millimeters in diameter with a 22 millimeter lug width and a 49.9 lug to lug distance. Now, I'm going to go over all of the functions of this watch before I step into the official review. But in case you're new to the channel, I like to start with the bad and then move on to the good before giving my final verdict on the review item. So let's talk tuna. You can cycle through 44 cities to set your local time by punching the plus or minus set buttons. And I'm gonna leave this over at New York City as that's where I live. But in this function, if you press the mode select button, you can also set daylight savings, second hour, minute, day, date, year. Uh, but more importantly, near the end of this, you'll have the power saving mode. This is how quickly your watch will turn off and save battery life. The movement inside of here, the caliber seven, or rather S802, has a five month charge on full battery, but in power saving mode, it will last up until 20 months, so not too shabby. Uh, this tap function is how quickly the light turns on. I'll show you how to operate that later. Um, I absolutely hate it, but we'll talk about that later. And that is what you do in your time and calendar mode. We have access to a chronograph by hitting the mode select button here, and you can gauge either lap or split 
time up to 9 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds in one-tenth increments with up to 100 recordable laps. And let me just show you what that looks like. I'll go ahead and start the chronograph now. Stop it. Reset it. I'll start it again. Stop it and reset it. Now, the next function on the mode select is our recall, and this allows me to look over those recorded time intervals. And I can do so by hitting the top left button here. Now, these are a channel to channel basis. So every time I start the chronograph, stop it, a new channel opens up, up to 100 channels that I can access and look up the record of times I recorded. Now, just past our recall function, we have a timer set up. This is the number of intervals the timer will go off. I have it set to five. Zero at the top left there indicates how many times it's already gone off. And setting this is quite easy. I have it set up for a minute right now. And if I were to start it, it will count down that minute and go off five times. So after five minutes, it will chime five times. Again, one of five at the top. We're just gonna go ahead and stop this midway and reset that. Now do note that the countdown timer can go anywhere from 10 seconds up to nine hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds. So practically 10 hours of countdown time in one second increments. Also, you have a daily alarm that you can access. You have three alarm channels you can save. So if you want multiple alarms going off during the middle of your day, you can set them here. Uh, pushing the top left button selects which alarm you want to use. Holding the middle button here will allow you to adjust the time on your alarm. You'll also notice that when I do that, the alarm I was on automatically sets. So as soon as I set the time for this function, I hit that button again, the alarm is on and armed for use. Now I wanna turn that off, so I'll just hit the bottom left button here to turn that off. And lastly, we have a solar gauge. This will rate the amount of battery left inside the solar cell on the left-hand side. And you'll notice at the top left, there's a little indicator to state that it's maxed out. You'll also see that on the right-hand side with the studio lights, it's picking up just a little bit of energy. They suggest leaving this out by a windowsill and after approximately six or so hours, it should get a full charge out of the box. So. Um, we're getting a little bit of charge here um, that tells you the level gauge of charge. It's not much. Of course, that indicator at the top right being the maximum amount of charge the solar cell can be receiving. Now you're already thinking to yourself, you have a countdown timer, alarms, as well as a chronograph that records split and lap time. That's already far less functions than your typical G-Shock in this price range, this being roughly $300. I bought this from Seiya for about $294. Uh, these are all sold out, so you can expect the prices to blow up, but your average G-Shock is anywhere between $60 and $80 for pretty much the same case material used here. Now, ultimately, the question on everyone's mind is, is it worth $300? Well, if you're a Seikoholic like myself, of course it is. Anything that says Seiko on the dial is worth it. But in all honesty, how has my time been with this watch? Well, let's jump into some of those bad notes. Now, of course, with that classic tuna case design, you have the shroud that envelops the bezel. And again, you don't have a clicking bezel. You have a friction-based bi-directional bezel, and it's nice, tight, uh, easy enough to grip and use with one hand, despite me operating it with both my thumbs here. And it is a little bit of an oddity feature here on the watch. I will state that I like that it's not just a decorative bezel that you can actually use it, but it feels kind of pointless seeing as we have a chronograph function in this watch. So we can already tell that the tuna case design here is absolutely unnecessary. They really could have put this solar movement inside of any other watch, but they're really banking on the sale of this tuna case look. Now Seiko isn't the only company to do the tuna case design. Uh, one brand that comes to mind are some older quartz Ricos that do feature the tuna case and design set, but we do associate the tuna can design with Seiko and it is one of their top selling designs. So I can see why they used it here, but it was unnecessary. And honestly, that's a major bad note for me because I, I don't like the fact that they're selling you on a look that's unnecessary for the caliber that's inside of it. I mean, it's cool, it's really cool. I love the tuna case design. 
However, it was an odd choice for this movement. Now, if this holds up like any of your standard fare SBBN tuna cases, then that's a good thing. You know, the added shroud for a little bit more protection, I like it, but it feels unnecessary here. But to give that bezel just a little bit of credit, you'll notice that there are minute markings around the outside adjacent the bezel on the solar panels, as well as a little minute indicator track on the inside of the digital interface. Um, you'll notice it says 35 minutes, it's recording 35 minutes. You'll use the bezel to graph elapsed time by lining the 12 o'clock loom pip up with that minute track on the solar panel. And yes, it does function, yes, it does work. We can see that 30 minutes have elapsed. Now let's talk about the interface in time and calendar, and this is arguably where you'll have this watch at for the most part. I really dislike the battery icon at the six o'clock. Why they decided to go with a battery icon is beyond me. It's very gaudy. It reminds me of looking at a cell phone, which is not what I'm trying to do. It's actually what I'm trying to avoid by wearing a watch to tell the time instead. There has to have been a better way to implement gauging how much power is left inside the solar cell of this watch. Something tells me that they, they could have done something beyond this, but they didn't because it was an easy choice to just put the battery icon at the bottom. It's an eyesore to look at, and it does eat up a lot of the real estate on this dial. It would have been nice if they used the touch functionality of the screen to gauge what the battery level was at, as opposed to activating the light, which is my next bad note. Activating the light on this watch is the biggest hassle Ever. It is the worst implementation of a backlight on a negative display that I've ever seen. It's just awful. I would have much rather had a button down at the six o'clock that activated the light as opposed to what they chose to do here. The instruction manual says while placed on your wrist, tap the screen to activate the light and it, it doesn't seem to work when off the wrist. I don't know if there's some sort of pressure function that allows you to engage the light, but I'll tell you it when it's on my wrist and I'll try it in just a second for you guys, when it's on my wrist, you can't, two things. You can't say how long you want it to be illuminated. It's always set for two seconds. And the pressure sensitivity for tapping the screen it, it doesn't seem to affect its ability to illuminate the screen that much between the three settings you have, which I'll show you now. And guys, you're just gonna have to forgive the finger smudges. I'm gonna be tapping the heck out of the screen to try to get it to start in a second. And that is the major issue here. This is very hard to read in low light. And this as a function to illuminate it, um, it has been nigh impossible. It maybe takes three to four tries to get it to illuminate. So if we were to hold the adjust button and hit mode to cycle through our settings here, you'll notice there is a function called tap. Now tap has three settings. One is uh, should be hypersensitive. Uh, zero is default, not not too sensitive, you know, it's, it's not too sensitive. And negative one is, uh, you know, you got, you got to really tap that thing to get it to start. And uh, why don't we just leave it at zero because this is what the default setting was. I'm going to use this moment to double as a wrist shot for you guys in case you're wondering what the SBEP001 looks like on a seven and a quarter inch wrist. Well, there it is, this humongous digital monster on my wrist. Um, this is what it's going to look like for all of your admirers, those lowly G-Shock individuals. And of course, if you want to admire it yourself, it's going to look a little something like this. And oh boy, ain't that one big hunk of plastic. It's crazy um, how well this actually wears on the wrist. Uh, surprisingly, it's not as monstrous uh, in feel. Uh, it might be because it's only 14.1 millimeters thick, but it actually doesn't feel that bad or out of place on my seven and a quarter inch wrist. Again, if you have a smaller wrist than mine, maybe it will feel like it. it's, it's eclipsing your wrist, but it being all black also sort of makes it feel smaller on the wrist as well. So it's got a few tricks up its sleeve to make it not wear so large, but um, you know, this is a tuna case. 
it's supposed to feel large. Now gang, I'm gonna do something I've never done on this channel. I'm gonna turn off these lights so I can illuminate this for you or just show you what it's like trying to illuminate this watch. So give me one second. Okay, you see me, you see me? No, you don't. God, this looks like one of those crime investigation documentaries, doesn't it? Here is the wrist shot. You can see it's pitch black, but um, you barely perceive my finger, but the idea here is that you're supposed to, you're supposed to tap the screen, tap the screen, tap the screen to get it to light up. Can you see that? Okay. Tap the screen. We're tapping. Can't you hear me tapping on your hard legs? Da -da 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 -da. Can't you hear me tapping on your watch? Oh, oh, yeah. All right, gang. Round two. Come on, big money, big money. Okay, I've had to adjust some camera settings just for you guys to see this because it's barely perceptible, but... There you go. Look at that. Look how bright that is. Not at all. Not bright at all. Pathetic. Whew. Anyways, that was one of the bigger bad notes for me. As you can tell, I don't like the light set up on this watch. I also don't like the negative display as opposed to a positive display. So what is good about this watch? Well, it's a Seiko, part of the Prospects line. That's always good, I guess. I mean, I'm a big fan of Seiko, but you know, I don't forgive everything. And there are a lot of shortcomings on this watch. I, I think overall, the movement here is fine. It's going to serve all of your day-to-day -day needs. It's a larger fashion watch in the form of a tuna. That's all there is to it. So if you wanted a tuna case design at a somewhat reasonable rate, this is a good way to get it. I mean, this is the evolution, the direct evolution of the Fieldmaster lineup. Uh, if you haven't seen, I reviewed a Seiko tuna Fieldmaster on the show. This is supposed to be, it's, it's, I don't even know what to call it, evolution. This is the next iteration. It's a shame. <laughs> You'd have just given me another automatic field master in a tuna case and I'd have been really happy, but this is such an oddity. Now here's the thing, guys. Would I recommend this watch? No, no, I would not. I would not recommend buying one of these if you can avoid it. Get a Casio G-Shock. Uh, one, you have a button for the light. Two, it has all the same functions. Three, same case material. Four, more variety. Five, more favorable scale. You know, not everyone's gonna wanna wear a 50 millimeter hunk of plastic on the wrist. Most G-Shocks, including the Square series up to this case model here, are under the 50 millimeter diameter range. It's just a more favorable look on the wrist. However, I will say some good points about this watch are the fact that the buttons on this particular model are easy to reach, very accessible. The learning curve for figuring out how this watch functions is not that difficult. Again, I picked up everything I need to know in a good 20 minutes. And, you know, there, there are positives to this watch, but they don't really outweigh the cons when you're looking at the competition. Now, just so you guys know, I purchased this because I'm a huge Seiko fan and I love the tuna case design, but just like I've been let down in the past, you kind of let me down again here, guys. I feel like you could have created a more truer to scale digital field tuna. This is an interesting first attempt, but it's not an amazing one. Ugh, it's such a shame, you know, what really separates this from its competition? Not much, you know, the battery reserve is great. I like how you can gauge how much solar power your watch is receiving. It's a little gimmicky and unnecessary because we got that little battery icon at six o'clock, but uh, yeah, Seiko, I hate to say it. This is not, this is not one of your crowning jewels. I, I think this is gonna be a very limited run. It's gonna be a collector oddity moving into the future. So if you wanted one for that reason, uh, now would be the time to get one, but I don't see this being as stable in their collection. It's just not good. Changes moving forward, maybe more screen real estate. The, the screen is nearly the size of a quarter on this watch. I would have preferred to have a larger display. Trim down the size of the watch. None of your other tunas, aside from the thousand meter divers, are this big and even then this is unnecessarily big make it a little bit smaller more favorable for more wrist give us a stainless steel body at 300 dollars, please who, who are you kidding me why am i spending this much for plastic also give me a positive display 
because it's far more legible. Add another button right around the two or, or three o'clock for you guys so that I can illuminate the face of this watch instead of tapping on the screen again like a ding dong. I was wearing this watch out the other day at work and my colleague was watching me. It was a dimly lit situation. He was watching me tap the face of my watch. He's like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there doing this and I look at him and I'm like, I'm just trying to tell what time it is. It, it was really, it was a really sad day for Seiko. And so far as the final verdict is concerned, I'm sure you guys can already guess my opinion. Uh, you can probably avoid this. It's not necessary. But if you did find this video enlightening or in the least entertaining, feel free to hit that like button. It looks a little something like this guy. If you have friends, forms, or groups that hopped aboard the hype train and are interested in buying this watch, we'll tell them to pump the brakes because it's just not worth it, okay? So share this video with them. Let them know the truth about the SBEP001 and its brethren. It's just not worth it, guys. And Seiko, if you're listening, Reduce the price of this watch. What are you doing? You know what? You're not going to. You're making money already doing this, but come on. I thought we're beyond this. Why fashion watches now? Why now? You're killing me, guys. You're killing me. And if you're new to the channel, well then, welcome. I do videos like this twice a week. I'd like to do three. God, hopefully they're not all this depressing. This is such a shame. <laughs> Don't buy this watch. Again, my name is Patrick Marlat, and thank you for the time, Casio. I appreciate it.